This episode, which relates to King Joachim, must not delay me any longer in a chronological recital of the events of this sad year 1814. In these times of trouble and anguish, King Joseph's prudence and firmness were not wanting to Napoleon, as is proved by the following letter full of energetic sentiments and a noble resignation. Letter from Joseph to Napoleon. Paris, February 9th at 8 o'clock in the morning. Sire, I receive a letter from the Minister of War and send your majesty the original copy. You will see that our resources in rifles are reduced to 6,000 and that it is consequently impossible to hope for a reserve army of from 30 to 40,000 men in Paris. Events are stronger than men, sire, and when that is established, it appears to me that it is true glory to preserve what one can obtain. It is not glorious to expose a precious life to a too evident danger, since it is not advantageous for a great number of men who have attached their existence to yours. Nobody here has anything to do, either directly or indirectly, with what I am writing to your majesty, with entire freedom of speech, just as it strikes my mind. You must submit to fate with courage, whether fate allows you to hope to be able to cause the happiness of a great number of men, or that it forces you to commit yourself, giving you no choice except between death and dishonor. And I see no dishonor for your majesty, as things stand, except in abandoning the throne. Because such an abandonment would cause the misfortune of a large number of people who have staked their all on you. If then you can make peace, make it at any price. If you cannot, you must perish like the last emperor of Constantinople. There is a splendid end for you. In this case, your majesty can be assured that in all and for all, I will obey your behests and that I shall never do anything unworthy, either of you or myself, Joseph. Whilst the military operations were following their course, the Congress opened at Châtillon sur Seine on February 7th. The Allies, full of pride at the success which they had gained at La Rotière, disavowed the bases which they themselves had proposed at Frankfurt, which the emperor had accepted and which assigned their natural frontiers to France. They demanded that she should return to the limits which had bounded her before 1792, that she should renounce all sovereignty or protectorate in Italy, Germany, and Switzerland. The Duc de Vincent's Calencor, already on February 5th, had full powers for signing peace. Napoleon investing him with unlimited powers was not aware of the new pretensions of the Allies. The Duc de Vicence did not think that he could take upon himself to make use of his full powers. He informed the Emperor of the communication which had been made to him. Napoleon declared that he was unable to leave France smaller than he had received her in 1800, that he would not purchase the conservation of his crown with a degrading treaty, and that he would abdicate if the nation did not support him. The Duc de Bassano, Marais, and the Prince de Vagram, Berthier, implored the Emperor to yield to necessity. Napoleon consented to close his eyes, but refused to dictate himself the conditions of this humiliation or to consecrate by an order signed with his own hand the degradation of France. He did not, however, revoke the unlimited powers which he had given to the Duc de Vicence. The latter fulfilled the painful part with which he was charged at the Congress with courage and devotion. He resigned himself in consequence to the hard condition of the former boundaries, but demanded the hostilities should cease at once. For all answer, the ambassadors of the Allies, satisfied at having obtained this concession, brusquely suspended the conferences. They alleged that they needed fresh instructions. They feared that perhaps they had not exacted enough. Considering no doubt that France had not fallen low enough, they thought to inflict a still crueler degradation upon her. Napoleon, hoping for nothing more from such enemies, far from allowing himself to be cast down by their exactions, 
found in the resources of his genius, one of those heroic maneuvers which were familiar to him, with the result that he won the battles of Shem Paubert, Mont Mirai, and Vauchon, besides several combats which filled the Allies' forces with terrors. Their plenipotentiaries made haste to have recourse to their usual tactics. They renewed the fallacious proposal of an armistice. This is a letter which Napoleon wrote to his brother Joseph on this subject. Nongi, February 18th, 1804. My brother, well, that's a typo, 1914. My brother, Prince Schwarzenberg, has at last given signs of life. He has just sent a flag of truce to ask for a suspension of hostilities. It is difficult to be cowardly to this degree. He had constantly refused, and in the most insulting terms, any kind of suspension of arms or armistice, and even to receive my flags of truce after the capitulation of Danzig and of Dresden, a horrible thing of which but few examples can be found in history. At the first shock, these wretches fall down on their knees. Fortunately, Prince Schwarzenberg's aide-de-camp was not allowed to enter. I only received his letter, which I shall answer at leisure. I shall grant no truce till they have quitted our territory. According to the news in my possession, all has changed amongst the Allies. The Emperor of Russia, who a few days ago had broken off negotiations because he wished to inflict worse conditions on France than that of the former frontiers, is anxious to resume them. And I hope very shortly to conclude peace on the Frankfurt basis, which is the minimum of peace with honor that I can conclude. Before commencing my operations, I have offered them to sign for peace on the condition of the former limits, provided they should immediately cease fighting. This demand was made by the Duc de Vicence on the 8th. They answered negatively, saying that the signature of the preliminaries would not put a stop to hostilities, and that this could only take place when all the clauses of the Treaty of Peace had been signed. This inconceivable answer was published, and yesterday, the 17th, they asked me for an armistice. You can imagine did seeing myself on the eve of a battle in which I was decided to conquer or to die, in which if I yielded my capital would have been lost, I would have consented to anything to avoid so great a risk. I owed this sacrifice to my self-respect, to my people, and to my family. But since they refused, since the hazard of the battle was played, and that all has returned to the chances of an ordinary war where the result of a single battle can no longer menace my capital. When all possible chances are in my favor, I owe it to the interests of the empire and to my glory to negotiate for a real peace. If I had signed peace on the condition of the former limits, I should have rushed to arms two years later, and I should have told the nation that it was not peace, but a capitulation that I had signed. I could not say so under the new state of things, since fortune having returned to my side, I am master of my conditions. The enemy is in a very different position from the one in which it was placed when the Frankfurt Treaty was proposed, and pretty well assured that it will bring Few of its soldiers back over our frontiers. Its cavalry is nearly worn out. Its infantry is exhausted by all these marches and countermarches. In one word, it is completely discouraged. I accordingly hope to be able to conclude a peace such as should satisfy any reasonable man, and my wishes do not extend beyond the proposals made at Frankfurt, signed Napoleon. The mission of Prince Schwarzenberg's aide-de-camp sent with a flag of truce prompted Napoleon to write directly to the Emperor of Austria to express the desire that negotiations might take a more conciliatory turn and might lead to a speedy signing of the peace. The victories of Nongy and Montereau gave Napoleon fresh hopes. In the meanwhile, the conference had recommenced on February 17th at Châtillon. On the same day, the emperor had revoked the unlimited powers which he had granted to the Duc de Vicence. 
the victory of the French armies having apparently modified the respective positions of the enemies. But Lord Castlereagh had just arrived and was present at the Congress. The object of the first pour parlays was the resumption of negotiations on the basis of a restitution by France of all the territory which she had acquired since 1792, a restitution in which the surrender of Antwerp, England's sine qua non, was formulated. At the same time, the Allies demanded that certain fortified towns in the interior of France should be surrendered to them. They founded their pretensions on the concession made by the French plenipotentiary at the time of the suspension of the Congress on February 9th. On the 23rd, Prince Wenzel Liechtenstein brought back the Emperor of Austria's answer to Napoleon's letter. The terms of this answer were conciliatory. Prince Liechtenstein protested that the Allies had no evil intentions either against the dynasty or against the Emperor's person. Even had this not been the case, the Emperor of Austria's envoy declared that Austria would never lend herself to such maneuvers, that all she sincerely desired was peace. This power had, as a matter of fact, very much less interest in a continuation of the war than the others. The principal object of her ambition was fulfilled, since she recovered Italy and her influence in Germany. Prince Liechtenstein renewed the proposal of an armistice, which, in his ardent desire for peace, Napoleon decided to accept. The Allies, discouraged by a series of defeats, had decided upon a retreat which almost became a disaster in proportion as the accumulation of their masses of troops in the outlets gave rise to greater encumbrance and disorder. A terrible panic seemed to have struck Prince Schwarzenberg's great army, the columns of which dragged on by the fugitives and by streams of equipage, retrograded with all speed towards the Rhine. Napoleon, having returned to Troyes, made his arrangement for maneuvering on the rear of the army command by Blucher, who tempted by the numerical inferiority of the corps of Marshal Mortier and Marmont, was advancing in a foolhardy way upon Meaux, while Schwarzenberg was continuing his retrograde movement. Napoleon's letter to his brother Joseph, Troyes, February 24th, 1814, 7 a.m. My brother, I have entered Troyes. The army of the enemy are besieging me with flags of truce to ask me for a suspension of arms. A truce will perhaps be negotiated this morning, but that can only be on the condition that Chatillon negotiations are pursued on the basis of the Frankfurt proposals. The Minister of the Interior is in a funk. He has a very wild idea about men. Neither he nor his minister of police have any more notion about France than I have about China. N. Letter from King Joseph to the Emperor, Paris, February 25th, 9 p.m. Sire, I have had occasion to see the ministers today in the council which was held by the Empress. I spoke to them of your majesty's successes and of your hopes. The minister of the interior is working hard on the lines marked out by you. A council will be held tomorrow. Monsieur de Montalivet is very zealous in your majesty's service. J. The emperor flattered himself or pretended to flatter himself that the resumption of negotiations would have a successful issue. He wrote from choice on February 26th at 6 in the evening. In the meanwhile, the Congress is in our hands, which proves that all the enemy's calculations have been upset. Lord Castlereagh has asked if his person will be in safety in view of the fact that he has no official position as ambassador. That, of course, cannot be questioned. Anybody touching the Congress, either directly or indirectly, is under the protection of international law. N. The demand for an armistice had been made at a time when the emperor's rapid movements and his unexpected successes had filled the allies with discouragement. Having got over this first impression and the Russian and English 
plenipotentiaries predominating at the Congress. They broke off the conferences at Lusigny under the pretext that Napoleon was mixing up with the military question points of discussion, which were without the scope of the Châtillon Congress. These conferences had not lasted more than four days. In the meanwhile, the only retreat open to the Silesian army under the command of Blucher was by Soissons. The French army occupied the roads by which the Prussian general was forced to pass. If Blucher did not succeed in forcing his way through Soissons, his position driven as he was into a corner against the Isne River would become extremely critical. Soissons had been put into a good state of defense and was provided with the garrison of 1,500 men, but the incapacity of the general in command threw it into the hands of the enemy. Not understanding the importance of the fortress which he was charged to defend, he capitulated on the morrow of the day in which the enemy presented itself before Soissons, satisfied with obtaining that his garrison should not be taken prisoners of war. It was in this wise that Blucher in the night of March 3rd was able to cross the river with the whole of his army and join forces which brought the total number of the soldiers with whom we had to fight to 100,000. The unexpected surrender of Soissons upset the emperor's plans and had a fatal influence on the issue of the campaign. This success raised the courage of the Allies, who reassured by their immense numerical superiority passed from a state of depression to one of exceeding confidence. Their shame at flight, the dangers to which numerous armies marching with their sovereigns at their head across a country in a state of insurrection and ready to bar the way of their return to the Rhine without stores and without ammunition, and finally the encouragement which they received from Paris determined them to cease their retrograde movement. They had succeeded in duping their adversary with sham negotiations and in winning time. The Allies, far from reducing their pretensions, had accordingly come to the opinion that they would have every advantage in persisting in their claims. They saw that the successes obtained by Napoleon, which were owing to the heroism of a handful of heroes who were not supported, cost the victor dearly, and that these successes themselves served but to weaken him. The four great powers signed a treaty at Chalmont on March 1st, by which they allied themselves still closer. They engaged in consequence to act on the offensive and not to retreat separately. They invited the other powers to join them and exerted extraordinary efforts to realize their object, which was to overthrow the emperor. England furnished fresh subsidies. On March 2nd, King Joseph received the following letter from the emperor. You are March 2nd, 1814, my brother. I desire you, on receiving this letter, to assemble under the presidency of the regent, the great dignitaries, my ministers, and the presidents of the Council of State, and to read to them the note containing the proposals of the Allies, my letter to the Emperor of Austria, Prince Schwarzenberg's dispatch to the Major General, and the draft of the note, which I have just dictated, to be handed by the Duke de Vicence to the Congress. In one word, all the papers which explain the state of affairs. The Duc de Cador will record what each one says. I do not want formal opinions, but I shall be glad to know each person's way of thinking. King Joseph answered this letter as follows. Paris, March 4, 1814. Sire, the Empress held the extraordinary council which your majesty commanded today. I ordered the papers which had been sent to me to be read. All the members of this council seemed to share the same opinion. They found the enemy's proposals very unjust, and they showed absolute confidence in whatever your majesty might order to your plenipotentiary so that France might enter into immediate enjoyment of the immense sacrifices which are demanded of you and which we well know will only be granted by your majesty in the last extremity. 
you better than anybody else are judge of that. But with fairly general unanimity, we are united in thinking that the necessity of seeing France reduced to the territory which she possessed in 1792 should be accepted rather than to allow the capital to be threatened. The occupation of the capital is looked upon as the end of the present order and the commencement of great misfortunes. Europe, entirely united, wishes to reduce France to what she was in 1792. Let this be the basis of a treaty which is imposed upon us by circumstances, but let the territory be immediately evacuated. In one word, prompt peace, no matter what it may be. It is indispensable. It will be a truce for two or three years, but good or bad, peace must be made. The emperor will make it as little unfavorable as possible. In the present state of things, it will always be an advantage since it will allow the emperor to occupy himself exclusively with home affairs and that by good management, he will be in a state to take back what has unjustly been demanded of him in which he has wisely accorded. The natural frontiers would be a real benefit for France and for Europe. They would give the hope of long peace, but nobody is forced to do what is impossible. Peace is indispensable today. This peace could cease on the day when France would be in a position to demand her rights. Conclude then a truce in petto, since the injustice of our enemies will not allow you to conclude a just peace. And when the state of things and of public opinion does not allow you to hope from France efforts proportionate to the object which has to be obtained. The Emperor of Austria's letter was found full of nobility and good sense. You will remain to France, and France will remain to you, as she was in the days when she filled Europe with amazement. And you who saved her once will do so a second time by signing peace today and by saving yourself with her. Be acknowledged by England, deliver France from the Cossacks and the Prussians, and France will render to you one day in blessings that which superficial minds might think you have lost in glory. I notice that I am indulging in too much verbiage. Whether your majesty has gained a victory or not, you must have peace. This sums up what everybody here thinks and says. Jay.